My Gavan and Melanine, and well met indeed. I'm Arik Eagala the head of the modding team behind Divide and Conquer, and welcome back to Divide and Conquer as we delve into another developer diary, and this time predominantly covering the seafaring peoples, Linden and Umbar. Umbar are more handled... Uh, Umbar will be pervasive throughout the entire episode today. Linden, we will focus on a little bit more in the battle map side of the campaign. Um, now, it might be reasonably might be a little bit lengthy and I can only apologize for that. Um, just briefly first of all um, with regard to the ongoing future of the channel in terms of dividing conquer content we recently did the poll choose your general and um, <laughs> I, I'm going to let many of you down and you'll be disappointed but um, Isengard won by about 60 votes but I'm not going to choose Isengard I'm going to choose the runner-up which was Lothlorien. Um, so that will come sooner, soon as the future. Umbar will also be a new campaign, which I'll talk about shortly in a moment, but an Umbar campaign will start. But I will do a few more Dale episodes before we start with um, probably the Lothlorien campaign. Just so that there's a bit of a staggered start between the two. So that's the outcome of the vote. Um, and I'll talk more about what I'm going to actually do with the with that gameplay in the Lorien video. So a little bit of a plug. But can you plug yourself in your own video? I mean, the whole thing is a plug for myself. Anyway, irrelevant. So let's dive straight in. So we've got some things on the campaign map to show you, starting with Rune. Rune have got some new campaign strategy models, or CSMs. We shall start with them. So not much really has changed with their village, but there is a runic village. Um, just distinct from um, many other middle uh, men of the east style cultures and then they jump up to a town here in Enmahath that is a new runic town you'll note that the assets in the center there are, are certainly taken from battle for middle earth 2 um, and adapted to work with the town so there is a town a runic town if we come across to, where did I put the next one over here in Varfest? There is a runic large town. The walls have gained slightly more prominence with towers on the corners. And it's a bit easier to defend. If we come back into Burro Monarchus, there is a runic city. Uh, again, so now fully stone walls with the towers um, have more than doubled in number. Uh, or um, only by a couple but <laughs> more towers and then finally the sh largest size city that the rune men of rune will get is here in Lest. apologies there's some trees in the way but you get the gist even more towers more structures in the middle just a bigger city but that is not all their castles have also been changed and we'll start here with elgar this is a new runic castle which is the second tier there aren't any runic modern baileys on the map because you can't build modern baileys. They're just there from game start. And as there are no runic ones, there's no point making a modern bailey for them. So we start with castle. This is what you would upgrade a keep to. I say modern bailey because that's what it's called in the files. In the game, it's called a keep. Keep castle stronghold. So there's a castle. There's some wooden um, edging on that first tier. And there's like a secondary tier for the castle, giving it a very unique shape. If we move up to Rubar, we come up to a stronghold. The main difference being the walls are now completely made of stone. Um, and there are a few more buildings throughout. And a couple more towers on the walls as well. Um, oh no, I think that the only real change um, is the walls go to stone. Um, but certainly giving rune now, they're completely... <laughs> Ted, or the Elite Dwarf, has completed what he set out to achieve long ago. Which is unique CSMs for everyone that should have one so there's very little crossover now so no longer will the cities of rune look identical to the cities of harad there is a clear distinction as you can see dividing conquer now has its own assets throughout the campaign map all courtesy of the elite dwarf if you ever see him do drop him a thank you uh, so that's rune but someone else has been amended as well the wild men and we start here in foldberg i did see did set it up so that see what a wild men village looks like but we use the wild men village as the hobbit model so <laughs> no wild men villages uh, oh no sorry the wild men village is do we still use it in onar yes there we are so onazanar onazanar uh, is a new that's a standard wild men village that's actually a very common village throughout middle earth for our um, cities but dis the wild men are, of course, in two distinct factions. There's the wild men who are real wild men and the wild men who are the northern Dunedain. And they have their own village. Uh, and there it is. So the northern Dunedain get the small little encampment um, with the tents and the trees. And the every other wild man gets on the settlement that you see there. Very, very good. It just looks good. It fits with their theme very nicely. 
But then we jump up to a town and there is a huge jump up. Now the reason the Elite Dwarf has gone with these designs is because this is what it looks like on the battle map. So he's reflected it on the campaign map. So there is your standard Wildmen town at Foldberg there. And once you get a town, the highest tier the Wildmen get is a large town and that is your large town. So the biggest difference being that the wall that originally only came to that corner now it covers the entire front um, and it's a substantially thicker and grander wall than it was in Foldberg. Also, as you could note, the keep on the top of the hill is far grander. The wall around the top of the hills is bigger. It's just bigger, basically. Make it bigger, make it better. We also have Wild Men Keeps, and this is the new Wild Men Keep. We have had custom Wild Men Keeps for a while, but the Elite Dwarf has improved on his work and given us here that we see in Derwa. Now, do note that I've edited the files so that we have this nice visual continuation. These are not actually going to be what these towns look like. Uh, so this isn't what you're going to have in your game. Derwath will be a... These will all be um, standard Rohirrim towns, villages, things like that. So don't worry about that. Anyway, so there's Derwath as a keep. Or more accurately, that is an actual Mott and Bailey. That is what they look like. And <laughs> Derwath now represents the keep quite nicely. And it upgrades to a castle there. Bregnas is currently representing a castle for us. And it's obvious the change there, as you can see. Substantially bigger wall around the outside, bigger keep in the middle, more buildings, just bigger and better across the board. So very nice indeed. Now another place that has been changed is the city of Dole Amroth itself, which may not look all that different, but it does now have slightly more custom design, um, and it is unique amongst the Gondorian and Amrothian designs. Um, so it just gives Dole Amroth a nice little bit more flavour. Now being at Dole Amroth rolls us in quite nicely to the next thing, which is custom ports. And as you can see there, Dol Amroth has one of the largest size ports, so it's fully upgraded. Oh, I'm not Dol Amroth, am I? Fully upgraded um, with the Gondorian stone walls, which looks excellent, and it's no longer medieval based. The largest size ports have a, um, a ship docked in their harbour there, as you can see as well. The smaller ones only have these small rafts and, and boats around the edges there. Um, but those are Gondorian ports, but it doesn't end there, my friends. There are ports all over. For example, if we come down to Umbar, there is an Umbarim unique port. The, uh, with the black sails and the black ships of the Corsairs in the centre. If we head over to Rune, I'm not sure if they actually have a port built anywhere, unfortunately. Ah, yes, there we are. There's a standard port up in Rune there. Um, now, it should also be noted that Rune, Harad and Kand can no longer build anything more than a tier 1 port. Um, so, naval... Well, just ports in general are restricted to far more nations now, or far fewer nations, sorry. There's more restrictions on the ports. If we come up to Esgaroth, there is a Northman port, which at the moment blends rather seamlessly with the model of Esgaroth. Uh, but rest assured, that is a Northman port. I don't think I can show it anywhere else. I don't know anywhere else that has one. If we come over to the Wildmen, there is a Wildmen port. Uh, very simple structure, but it's got a couple of watchtowers, which is nice. And fine, if you come up to Linden, most of the Linden ports at the moment are, are the lower tier ones with just the half elven design, or rather, they have a semicircle, but they are of elven design. But then the highest tier port here in Mithland again has a ship of the elven fleet docked at the port and has a nice elven design around the edges. So there's very little medieval works left on the map, which is just excellent. Right, so the last of the CSMs is a minor one, and that is that over here in Nern, the grain resource has been cut down quite significantly, and a new sort of orc farm resource has come in, as you can see there. I won't hover over it, because at the moment it says Amun Hen, although I've just pointed that out. It says Amun Hen at the moment, I haven't changed the text, but that's going to be an orc farm, um, which just gives Nern a little bit less of a jarring appearance where you see these grain mills. Because obviously these grain mills at the moment, there's four that you see on screen, but they used to be about ten, so it used to really detract. But of course there are slaves that live in Nern, and they would eat from the grain mills, so the grain mill persists. Right, um, so that before we get into Linden and Umbar, the only minor thing to talk about is Lothlorien. One of our beta testers requested that Rumil and Orofin join Lothlorien. They are, of course, Haldir's brothers, and they do join Lothlorien now. So if you play as Lothlorien and you take Dol Guldur, you will be gifted one of the brothers. They will have a unique bodyguard. Then if you reach a point where your nation has 10 settlements, the other bodyguard, the other brother, will come into your army. And you'll have a total of four unique generals, which just gives you a bit of something to work for. It just means that 
getting Dogle Dogle Dog gives you a bit of a reward immediately. And getting 10 regions is an, another sign that they're saying, right, we need a proper general to lead our armies now here. Have Rumiel and Oracle. So a nice little touch for Lorien. Right, the only changes to Umbar on the campaign side are a region change, which is the keen eye amongst you may have seen. And Lond Arthuran has again gone. Well, not again gone, but Lond Arthuran has gone. Um, it's another place where it was kind of wasted on Linden. They really didn't need the four starting regions, and it could be put to much better use elsewhere. So Under Towers now has been redesigned, and it's no longer the um, like curve shape that it was, like a banana resting against the edge of the Shire. And it's now just a normal region there, covering the actual towers themselves. And a point of note is that the Palantir for this region is now in the settlement of Under Towers and not in Mythlond. Um, which I just thought was better because the Palantir, of course, is actually itself in the Towers of Elastirian. Uh, so, or the Tower of Elastirian, which is the tallest and greatest, and that houses the Palantir. Together, they're the White Towers of Emin Baride, uh, which means Tower Hills in Sindarin. Uh, so, the Palantir is in the Under Towers now. Karaskalainen has taken up the slack of that little bit of land that was there and is so slightly larger. Londartharan has been moved to Harad, where it now forms this region, the Emun Hanan, which just means the hills of the Hanan, because uh, they're hills and they're next to the Hanan River. And it is Esthala. Esthala is Sindarin, it's uh, Lenishan and quite a lot of uh, Lenishan at that, um, of Estel and Thala, meaning final hope. Um, I thought that was a rather fitting name because this town kind of marks the most southerly border of Gondor, um, discounting Umbar at the sort of height of its power. This was the last point that was actually completely held by Gondor. Whilst they held sway over the Haradrim, they didn't actually own the Haradrim. So in the same way that, for example, England firmly holds sway over the county of Hertfordshire in which I live, and it fully governs and owns it. Um, whereas we only kind of just sort of hold sway over um, many of the colonies that we had in the past. It's that kind of relationship. So we fully, Gondor fully own Horondor and Estala was the final, the most southerly point. So I thought Final Hope was a good name. I don't know. Many of you will not know that it means that, of course, and will forget anyway. So to most of you, it's just a town called Estala. So that's the Linden change. Right, so we come on to Umbar. Umbar have been dramatically changed, as you will note, because you have already at the moment are wondering why does Umbar not own their own lands. And they no longer do. So some backstory, some lore story, settle in, um, or just skip to the battle map if you don't want to listen to this bit. Umbar in Dak were always were added just because it was very clear in the battles of the Pelennor Fields and the Third Age that Gondor was attacked by the Corsairs of Umbar, and the Haradrim. And that was enough for the original Dak team to split Umbar into their own faction. So Umbar the city, Harad the main enemy on the right. Now for most of Dak's his history, Umbar have done sod all. They've never been involved in the gameplay. The original Dak team took all of their units from other mods and they very much were a butchered faction made up of lesser parts. A Frankenstein's monster of a faction, if you will. We have subsequently been injecting more life into Umbar and giving them more of their own identity and less the sum of parts, rather a whole. But in the, along the way, we've turned them very heavily on the Black Numenorean heritage idea. Now, this is where we can put some rumours to bed. Black Numenorians or King's Men or Dark Numenorians are synonyms of all the same thing and they are peoples of Numenor, which is of course way out to the west and now sunk beneath the sea. At a time in Numenor's history, they begin to qu they began to question the Valar. Uh, they began to question why they couldn't sail to Amman and why the Valar didn't allow them to leave the site of their island. And of course, they began to seek immortality to an extent, although that reached its peak with Um So the Numenorians began formed into two separate parties on their island. The King's Men were those loyal to the kings of Numenor, and they kind of set against the Valar, and the faithful were those that stayed true to the Valar. And so there were two clear um, political parties, if you will, although it was more like cultural leanings. I don't know the best word for it. Anyway, it all comes to a head. And um, Arpharazon eventually asc ascends to the throne and he sails back to Middle-earth and he captures Sauron here in Umbar. Um, Umbar was founded by King's Men, or so Numenor, or not necessarily, it was founded by Numenorians, but it quickly became a haven of the King's Men, whereas places further north, such as Londaire, for example, were just standard Numenorian um, havens. 
They capture Sauron. Sauron turns them against the Valar completely. They sail off to Amman. Most of them are killed. Um, uh, Valinor, uh, Numenor sinks beneath the sea. Most of the king's men are killed, and the faithful escape found in Gondor and Arnor. However, some king's men were not on the island when it went down, and some do... Um, I don't think any do get away, but enough of them were already in Middle-earth that their culture continued to exist. And they were centred mostly around Umbar, and further south, and that's where the crux of the Umbar thing comes in. So the Umbarim, the or the King's Men, settled in Umbar and in colonies to the south, way out of, of Middle Earth. Umbar eventually, um, the Black Numenorians were eventually beaten by the Gondorians, and Umbar became just a Gondorian city. Then, of course, Castamir the Usurper rose up against um, the king that he felt didn't have sufficient blood to rule. Many people joined Castamir, and amongst the most loyal of his were the peoples of Umbar, because they still harboured that kind of ancient grudge, if you will, or I don't know, maybe Black Numenorean blood still persisted. But Castamir was thoroughly put down, and, and Umbar again was captured by Gondorians, and at this point, the Black Numenorean slash traitor line is completely wiped out in Umbar. This is where Dak then takes it into its own little um, faction. So Umbar has been taken over by the Haradrim, which represented in game are now by rebel armies of Better Haradrim troops. On the field of but the Dark Numenorians who survived far to the south, the premise now with Umbar, as we arrive here, is that they have returned to claim their birthright. So the reason the Umbar faction in Dak, or we've actually renamed them, they are now called the King's Men. And the reason the King's Men faction now have such a dark Numenorean leaning is because we're just fully buying into the idea that they are king's men, that they are descendants of black Numenoreans who have come up from the south and returned at this point to claim back their lands. So, the premise with Umbar is you start here with your king, Ar Gimilkad, and Ar Gimilkad, Ar is his title, you'll be interested to know. Now, the army that he starts with is actually different every single time, so there's no point memorising this, you might have a totally different army. But Lord Gimel Zor, the faction heir, does start with the three rangers, and he himself has rangers as well. Um, the portraits are yet to be changed. We are going to change them to be a bit more Black numenorean -y, And Hummingbird is working on changing the symbol to also be um, a, a Black numenorean symbol rather than a number in one. So if you now play as Umbar, you will start here with these two gentlemen and a ship. You can go anywhere you want. You start the game as Umbar now with no allies and no enemies. And the reason for this, which I will just digress and talk about as well, is because of course the Numenorians, and particularly the king's men under Ar Farazon, Numenor's arguably greatest ever king, with some caveats, they capture Sauron and they defeat his army utterly. And they take him back to Numenor, where he then of course rises through the ranks and becomes a chief advisor to Ar Farazon. And so he's he is held in high regard, but... He is the reason Numenor is sunk beneath the sea. And so the peoples of Numenor who survived, the king's men that did survive the downfall, would surely now come to see him as the liar and traitor that he was and not some grand being to worship. So as such, you do not start allied to Sauron. Equally though, it's been quite some time since you've ever had any threats or wars with Gondor, so I've set it so that you're also not at war with them. Um, and the only nation that you kind of sort of semi-like is Harad, so that players who want a slightly easier time getting on with Harad can make that alliance quicker and easier. And also so the AI doesn't attack Harad as much, because I can't change the faction standings depending on AI, or or I'm sure I can, but I just couldn't be bothered. <laughs> so you start basically neutral to everyone. It's very much a Total War style gameplay, but in the normal campaign. So no alliances, no enemies, no one hates you, no one particularly likes you. You're a total newcomer and entity. And I have also set it so that, as you may see, your victory conditions are merely to hold 60 regions. I did think about having Umbar as a victory condition, but that forces you to take Umbar. That forces you to play exactly the same way, at least a little bit, every time. And I didn't want that. So your victory conditions are actually just take whatever you want. So you can sail anywhere you like. Come up to Balorn and make that your capital if you want. Sail all the way up to Mithlond and take that out turn one be the world's your oyster. Um, do note, of course, that the Umbar enslavement system only works as far as Rohan. Um, it might be expanded given the work we've now put into Umbar, but at the time of recording this, which is the 27th of January 2018, 
Umbar do not get enslavement beyond the um, area of Rohan. So you can enslave Rohan, Gondor, Dol Amroth, Harad, Kand, and that is it. So you will gain more units and more unit variety if you stay in the south. But, um, of course, you can go as far north as you want. Now, if we did expand the enslavement, which, I pro to be honest, I probably will, um, I would only expand it to sort of like Enidwyth and Dunland, almost certainly, and that would be more of a slave thing rather than a them fighting for you thing. Equally potential to expand it to Bree. The Dunedain, I would not expand it to because the Umberin would just crush the Dunedain. They wouldn't, get, they wouldn't try and win them over. Of course, you're never going to be able to enslave orcs, so no evil nation. Elves would never fight for you no matter what. They'd rather die. Dwarves are the same. So it'd only ever be humans that you would be enslaving anyway. Um, but there is that system, which has been in the game for a, a while. I don't know if it's been in 1.2, actually, so I don't know. Anyway. Umbar, of course, have their own custom CSMs from the, either the last uh, developer diary or the one before. So there's, they are a completely unique faction now. But the final thing I just wanted to show you is, um, I deliberately didn't spell his name right so he wouldn't move and I could say all of that and then I forgot to take the N off, is I've also changed their colour um, because I think it's far more fitting. Um, and so they are now black with a yellow outline rather than yellow with a black outline. So, and that is obviously shown by their banner, which just fits 100% better than it did before. And the only nation you'll ever have trouble with if you um, rock up next to them is, of course, Isengard, who are also black. But they have a grey outline, and you have a very obvious yellow outline. So, and the chances of you arriving there are very slim anyway. Now, the only thing I've got left to work out is how to get Safwadar here. Or Safwadi, sorry. I need to get him into the city, and I've got to think of ways to do that. Um, because at the moment, his large Haradrim army, which includes Mumakil, is not of any use. As you just saw, I just walked past him and took the city. Um, of course, Rebels turn on at turn 30, and he'll start giving you some jip then. But ideally, I want the battle for Umbar to be big if you do try and take it. So, that's the campaign map. Now we move on to some delights in the battle map that I've not yet shown you. So, I shall see you in just a moment. Welcome then to the battle map and some of you will already be looking at those cards down the bottom and thinking oh my word what joys await and this is so we'll start where we left off before with Umbar. Now first of all let me just say Enid Wyth actually are already included in the Umbarim enslavement so I will expand it to include Bree and Dunland probably even the Anduin as well because it only takes a little bit of time and it's it's cracking good fun. Um but I probably won't bother with Rune, Dale, or Dorwinian because they're just absolutely miles away. But anyway, so this is the Umberim roster if you train a couple of Gondorian and Dol Amroth units. So some of them have been seen, but not all of them, and they've all been improved. So here we are with basic Territorial Guardsmen with an Umberim theme. They are just Territorial Guardsmen, but with a darker, more evil-looking shield to match the Umbar theme. But, as you will note there, the Citadel Guard that stands with them is also now fully Umbarim-inspired. Or King's Men. We need to stop calling them Umbar, because they're not Umbar anymore. And the Banner Carrier even has a Kingsman symbol, and he himself has been turned more King's Men-like. Or, let's just call them Black Numenorians. what the hell. But if you upgrade your Territorial Guardsmen, they upgrade to look like this. Which again, similar to the Gondorian theme, but with a Black Numenorian twist. So those are the Territorial Guardsmen, which can form the basis of your army. Basically, if you take Gondor or Dol Amroth, you can have an entirely new looking army. Just out of nowhere. <laughs> so Gondor Militia for the Black Numenorians have just the symbol of Umbar on their shield. Which is the um, Tengwa letter B. Which is... N which n it's, its name in Sindarin is Umbar, which is why they're represented by it. Uh, but if you upgrade your Gondorian militia, there they are with, the, again, the Black Numenorian theme. Very black themed, really. <laughs> Gondor infantry also now have a Black Numenorian theme with a more sinister vibe. And of course, the, the shield has been updated. But they too update, even with their armor. And as you can... You'll note that Hummingbird has given him all like a dark tinge to the armor. So they really do give off the vibe of dark or black Numenorians, which they look so cool. And this is massively a well, part of the reason why Umbar is going to be one of the campaigns I start up in the coming days. Now, if you take Dol Amroth, the Seawood Footmen here also now have a dark Numenorian theme. You can note, again, the updated shields and uh, chainmail and whatnot, and just Umbar pervades, or black Numenorian pervades. Uh, their upgrades also have the same design. So you can upgrade at the blacksmith and you'll keep the black Numenorian theme. 
And we come along to the Lebenin Marines, who have been totally recolored to fit the Black Numenorians. They're no longer blue and browns or whatever they were before. They're now just the blacks, browns and reds. But they match with the Black Numenorians. So there's those. And there they are upgraded with their chainmail and kind of Roman looking pauldrons. Or shoulder guards, are they called pauldrons? I don't really know. Archer Militia haven't really changed at all because they don't have a shield. But the upgraded version has... And there they are, upgraded with Black Numenorians. And finally, the Cavalry. Gondor Cavalry Militia and Gondor Cavalry Militia upgraded somewhere. Ah, the one next door, yes. Oh, I don't actually think there's any change. No, they seem to be the same. But anyway, the Dol Amroth Squires also now have a Black Numenorean theme as well, which is red and black, as we've seen throughout. So if you play as Umbar, or need to really get used to not calling them that, if you play as the King's Men, you will note that taking some Gondorian and Dol Amrothian places will give you their troops. Also, I forgot to mention in the campaign side, Umbar or the King's Men now have their own religion called Black Numenorean. So no matter where you conquer, you have to convert the populace first. Right, the other change is to Bree, and we can start here with the Bree Land Militia. They have been kind of downgraded, if you will. Here they are on the left, sorry. So this is the standard Bree Land Militia now. They are actual militia. Um, so they look very much like people who have just been given a spear and a shield, and they've gone off to war in their own clothing. If you upgrade down the Arnorian style, if you take the military path, then they get that Arnorian theme, as you can see there. There are also archers who are at the back here. Again, simple archer militia on the left, upgraded to look Arnorian on the right. And the old Breland theme has now been given over to the Watchmen. So the Watchmen Bogard now have that old, kind of happy, jolly Breland um, design. And they upgrade under the Arnorian style again there to look very, very Arnorian. Which is cool. And the same thing happens here, as you can see, with the Axe Guard, who now have that same Breland design with the happy flowery shields and they upgrade to the Arnorian style, although those are the sword guard, where are the axe guard? Over there. Exactly the same but with an axe and are under the Arnorian theme. Uh, so the sword guard are knocking around somewhere. Or maybe I didn't select sword guard. Oh, they're at the back, they're general. Yeah, there we are. So there's a sword guard. So simple changes for Bree. Another unit that has just been updated very recently are the Wind Riders of Cand. Hummingbird has recently a tweaked and adapted these gentlemen so that his description of them is that they now look like the elite militia that they are in that they are not your elite units they are very much a middle tier kind of unit but they are very very good <laughs> they are of course the game's fastest unit no other cavalry unit runs as fast as the wind riders of cans and so they're excellent at chasing things down um, and i had to just in case they had an armor upgrade but they uh, they don't so there we are. But then the big change. Many of you will be familiar with Arthalion on Total War Center. Now Arthalion has made some absolutely epic strides with the Elven units. And he finally got permission from Louis Lux to release them and immediately gifted them to Divide and Conquer. In fact he's even joined the better testing team now. So we can now look at... Oh I need to do sprites for them. But these are the Sindar units which are the middle tier for Linden. And here they are in game. So those are the Sindar Spearmen. Looking particularly nice with the feathered helmets there. Um, and there are Sindar guards behind who have an axe and a shield and then a sort of semi chainmail. And they just look very nice. They look very, very elven and they fit with the theme wonderfully. And there they are upgraded with full chainmail um, and slightly heavier design. There's Mithlon Nobles have also been given a touch-up and no longer look like the Third Age Total War Mithlon Nobles. They now have their own design. Slightly more prominent helmets looking pretty cool. I like the feather design, that's very good. Um, and they just look really nice, <laughs> let's be honest. And there they are, also upgraded I believe. Uh, yes, they get a slight boost, they get um, some armour on their chests. But the Sindar Archers have also been upgraded. There they are at the back. There's Lindar Mariners running in from the back there. They've also been tweaked. And there's Sindar Archers at the front. And there's upgraded Sindar Archers over there. A kind of more bronzy theme. So they start off a bit silvery and they update to be a bit more bronze-like. But only a, only slightly. It's not overpowering. And then there are the cavalry. Sindar cavalry indeed. Riding with an axe and a shield in their beautiful now regalia. Regalia, regalia. There we are. 
So those are the new units. Those are some new units for this developer diary anyway. My favourite unit, I have to confess, is the Black Numenorean Gondor Infantry upgraded. I think they look amazing. <laughs> they suit the black and red style so much. I really like it. Really like it. So all of this, of course, coming in version 2, which I will repeat, we hope to release before the end of the first quarter of 2018, which we close upon soon enough. Um, so it'll all be yours, and then some in a short while. But for now, that is everything. So thank you very much for tuning in and watching, if indeed you have. Thank you for enduring the rant in the middle regarding um, a bit of backstory behind Umbar, uh, or now the King's Men. And um, if you have any questions, pop them in the comments below. And look forward for, I will do a King's Men campaign that will start hopefully this coming week. Um, and then a Lothlorien campaign will start after that based on the votes that you all gave in the recent poll. I apologise that I've not taken Isengard. I mean, the video is pretty much over now. I'm going to just ramble a bit about the reason I chose that. Um, Isengard has been done to death on, on YouTube. And I a lot of people wanted a Total War campaign. So it will be a Lothlorien Total War campaign with house rules. And I've selected the house rules I'm going to use. And I might explain that in a moment. But Isengard wins in almost every single vote I ever do. Um, which I know eventually means I should get round to doing an Isengard campaign. But there really isn't that much different about Isengard in DAC and Isengard in the base game. Other than the Ring script. But of course the Ring script has been out in its entirety since 1.2. So most people should be familiar with it. But the reason I don't do Isengard mostly is because I don't find them interesting. And I think their campaign would be so easy. Even with House Rules. They're in such a simple position, and I just I don't want to fall into that same trap. So it'll be Lothlorien to add in the difficulty of expensive elves. And um, the house rules that I will choose, I will explain now because I can. Um, the house rules are going to be as follows. Number one, a general is only going to be able to lead a certain number of troops, and it will be restricted by, somebody commented this, and I, I like the idea, and I'm going to go for it. So a general can only lead two times the number of command stars he has in units. So if he has two command stars, he will be able to lead four units. If he has ten command stars, which your general, your cap faction leader most certainly will, he can lead the full 20 armor, 20 banner army size. So that will allow... That gives you, rather than an arbitrary, a very arbitrary kind of like, oh, don't have any um, banner armies with over 10 units. This actually gives you a reason. So you're not going to give a full army to a general who doesn't have the command to lead it. So the generals have to earn their command, and that's the idea behind that. So a general with one star can only have two extra units, including his bodyguard. No, sorry, not including his bodyguard. So it'll always be his bodyguard and then two times the number of command stars he has. So that's rule number one. in our favour. Victory will be ours. Rule number two is going to be that no army can have more than one general. It's a very basic and simple way of, ch of increasing the difficulty for yourself, and it works wonders. So no army can have more than one general in it, um, which is an, a very simple, straightforward rule. The third rule I'm going to use is that um, it's an expansion. A lot of people liked the idea that I only fight battles that my faction leader is present in. But as Wolferson correctly pointed out, in my opinion, or I share his opinion rather, that would unfortunately lead to a situation where an awful lot of your battles are being auto-resolved and the campaign may lose some of its um, in enjoyment, basically. So I'm going to expand upon that system and instead say that I can only command battles where a general leads the army. Now, I very rarely ever use captain-led armies anyway. And of course, a captain-led army is just any army that you don't put a general on. But it will mean that if I'm ever marching reinforcements anywhere and they get attacked or they get ambushed, I have to just auto-resolve. So I will only lead battles where there is a general present. I will only have one general per army and generals can only command two times the number of command stars they have for their number of troops. So I think with those rules in place on a Total War Lothlorien campaign, we should run into some real trouble. Now, of course, Celeborn will be able to march around as an absolute boss, as will Haldir, but anybody that subsequently follows will not have very many troops to command at all. And of course, I can never combine Celeborn and Haldir together, so it will create some interesting fusions, I think. So that's been my decision, that's everything, and that ends the video. So thank you very much for watching, if indeed you have, and until we speak again, dear friends, Navarna den Pedimad Melunin.
and farewell.